Flight attendants, please prepare for takeoff. Dropped it for Shankly, back to Wheeler, shot, he scores! Oh, a thing of beauty! Patrick Wayne has goal number five! Hit for Kyle Connor, to Greg, score! That was beautiful, get it in cue for the highlight reel. Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets, hosted by Jets TV. 18-10-2 is where the Winnipeg Jets find themselves after the 30-game mark of the 2019-2020 season. I'm Jamie Thomas, Mitchell Clinton, Tyler Esquivel for another edition of Ground Control, the official podcast, the Winnipeg Jets. What a up-and-down kind of week for the Jets. Uh, they take two, or sorry, five out of possible six points, uh, find themselves back in third spot in the ultra-competitive Central Division following their 3-2 win over the Anaheim Ducks on Sunday in a game that featured Mark Shifley recording his 400th career NHL point, and on top of that, Nick Ehlers recording his third career NHL fight. Which we all anticipated would happen. His comb- his choice of opponent is 225-pound Ryan Getzlav, who, according to uh, the weight, Nikolai Ehlers apparently is 175, Getzlav 225, you do the math. That's uh, generous. A severe mismatch at that point. I'm curious what the, what the, the UFC... Uh, weight classes would have been, or the disparity yes. between the weight yeah. classes would have been, but <laughs> guess yeah, I, I would mean... have to drop some serious weight before that fight, <laughs> or either would have to bulk up. <laughs> yes. Put a few bricks One in of the his two. pockets. Um, I know Paul Maurice joked about it. I know it seemed like he wasn't a big fan of the decision, but Ehlers pointed out the fact that he wasn't having a very good game, so this is his way, I guess, of getting himself yeah. into the game. Uh, choice of partner, a little questionable. The fight went as 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 you know you would expect, um, not a Nikolai Ehlers failure, but at the same time, especially with uh, tussling a little bit with Jamie Ben on Thursday in Dallas, you're starting to see another side of Nick Ehlers that we're not nor- used to seeing. I wonder, and this isn't coming from from him in any way, but I wonder if it's one of those things where you know he's a guy that obviously a, a skilled player. This is probably no different for a lot of skilled players in the National Hockey League, and you can't do this every time, but. Sometimes if people are taking liberties of whacking at you and everything, you do have to, in some way, doesn't necessarily have to be a fight. Just kind of let them know that that's not something you're going to put up with um, throughout the game. Now, of course, the Winnipeg Jets do have, you know, some some bigger guys and everything. But sometimes, you know, it can give the, the bench a little bit of a boost. Obviously, I think a lot of us, when the gloves came off, all of us took the, the deep gasp, like, just don't break anything or get hurt or anything like that but um i mean yeah i mean ehlers kind of did what he could in that fight like you mentioned giving up 50 pounds but just glad that they both kind of got out of there unscathed and uh and went on but blake wheeler did kind of touch on it after the game just saying not necessarily the fight but it's kind of the evolution of nikolai ehlers as he continues to get older that you know you, you try to find ways to turn a night where you just you don't necessarily have it going for you, just like Ehlers said, and turn that into a B plus. You know what I mean? Not every game, no matter how hard you try, is going to be an A plus. Sometimes you just don't have the bounces going your way. You just got to find a way to contribute in, in some way or get yourself going or something. And uh, I think that's something that, that uh, Blake Wheeler kind of touched on that he feels has kind of evolved in uh, Nikolai's game. You could see why Paul Maurice was concerned, and, and his teammates for that matter, because it seems consistently the theme is Paul Maurice pointing out the fact that the Wheeler line with Jack Roslevic and Nikolai, Nikolai Ehlers was the team's best. And on this afternoon at Bell MTS Place, they weren't, but you could see why Nikolai Ehlers decided to do so, but you can also understand other side of things. His four-game point streak came to an end. He's now tied with Mark Shifley for most goals on the team, each with 13 after Shifley co- scores a couple of goals. It was a strange game. And it seems like afternoon games always, or matinee games for that matter, Duke, you're not, you're not sure what you're going to get, especially when the Jets are at home. Uh, they fight it out, and, and again, another one-goal victory, and it's almost becoming predictable when the Jets are in these situations, Tyler. Yeah, more or less. Uh, after the game, Paul Maurice had said that, you know, this was sort of the end of the block where – they had identified that there was going to be some long travel stretches between games. They obviously come back 
from Dallas uh, on Thursday night. That's about a, what, a three hour flight. Yeah, shade under three. Um, so this is sort of the last of the bunch where, you know, you're in that grind and, and now you can kind of not exhale a little bit, but, you know, let your foot off the gas in terms of having to be, uh, make sure your sleeping schedules are right and everything's proper. You know, things are just a little bit easier on the guys now. And I think they'll, they'll take that time to rest and recoup. They play again on Tuesday night yeah. and then off to Detroit for Thursday for a one game trip and then they're back. So, uh, a big opportunity lies ahead. You have two games against the Detroit uh, Red Wings that you Those should. Those danger games where you're looking, yeah. I mean, call a spade a spade. Like, they're dangerous. The Detroit's not having the season that they that they would like to have, obviously. But, you know, you you got to be ramped up for both of those games. And then you have a game against Philadelphia, who, you know, is on a bit of a tear right now. Yeah. So, you know, three, three big games coming up for the Winnipeg Jets in the next uh, few days. So, uh, interested to see how those go. <laughs> For them to be sitting in third place with everything that happened at the beginning part of the season, they've used the waiver wire more than they're used to, or they have in years past, but it has been successful for them. Um, it's just an evolution of a season that's just weird. It's, yeah, it, it, but I mean, it all comes down to winning. resiliency, right? And, yeah. and, figure, and finding ways to, to win hockey games and get points, and that's what they've been able to do. And I mean, it's full credit to... to players in the dressing room and, and the coaching staff, of course, and, and everybody involved because it's it's not easy going – and we mentioned the Detroit Red Wings and how it can be – those matchups are going to be difficult. That's exactly what the the mindset that the team has going out every single night. It's it's not ever going to be at a situation where it's like, okay, we're going in and, you know, we'll win this game. We're good. We can get by on skill. They, they – you know, maybe statistically that, that skill is there. I mean, any – we just talked about Mark Scheifele hitting 400 career points, you know, and he did that in less than 500 games. I believe he's the second fastest in franchise history to do that. So yes, there's a whole bunch of skill, but this Jets team isn't one that's going in to any hockey game thinking this is going to be easy. They they pretty much go in embracing the fact that it's going to be an absolute grind. So that when you know you do get into those tight games, those one goal games that they're now 12, uh, 12 two and two in, your your mindset is right. Mm -hmm. that you're in the the place that you need to be in terms of uh, your mental focus going into the night so as much as you know it's been a a weird season in terms of everything that's kind of gone on whether it's injury wise or, or or whatnot they're a team that just continues to just find ways to win get that w move on to the next one a great example of that is the fact the jets had gone three games without a power play goal the power play is up and down which is odd for this team and we've talked about this ad nauseum uh, on many of these podcasts already and we were just the po the power play had not generated anything in their first three opportunities against anaheim but it is the power play that comes through for the game winning goal so every time you think something's there's an issue oh the power play pops one in yeah and that i mean talk about a, a good time for it anaheim had tied the game six seven minutes earlier on a real weird one that the puck just kind of bounced all over the place and ends up going in off of Hellebuck's pad. And then, you know, you get that power play opportunity and, you know, you could just kind of sense it, whether it was in the building. Uh, obviously, we're not on the Jets bench, but you get an opportunity like that with less than five minutes to go in the third period. You know, they're all feeling like this is this is what we're – this is what we want. These are the types of players we want to be. We want to be big game players. And boom, Mark Shifley scores. And I asked Blake about the power play – after the game and, and he said as much as he said you know that's our job to, to come through he also said like we got a lot of skill on that power play there's for him as a guy that you know he's taking his fair bit of shots on goal as well but he looks around at the the weapons that they have and he says you know like Mark Scheifele's a guy you get him in that spot he's one of the best in the league and I mean he showed it against uh against Anaheim on Sunday and also in Dallas on on Thursday I mean it was he couldn't have been six, seven feet away from the exact spot he shot from. Maybe on the other, the other side hash mark. But yeah, he's in that spot. Game on the line. Back in the net. There's always the little things that go into winning one goal games, and I, I think we should give some credit. Adam Lowry's, you know, had a fat fight with Ryan Reeves earlier this year in a critical point of a game in Vegas, and that turned out to to get the team going. He gets hurts his hand uh, in the game against Anaheim. Stops taking faceoffs for the Jets, but scores. We believe a it was we, his we hand. think we think an injury. We'll go with an injury that forced him to miss some time in the game. Comes back, 
stops taking faceoffs. Andrew Kopp goes in, wins seventy three percent of his faceoffs, and Lowry ends up scoring a goal anyways with yeah. said injury. So guys are stepping in in places when injuries happen, and it seems to be a consistent factor where wherever there's a hole, somebody's there to fill it in. Yeah, Tyler can probably like fill in on this as well. Like for Andrew Kopp, there was never an issue earlier in the season because he that, he started at center yes. and was doing very well in the faceoff dot and so it's no surprise he slides into the middle on that exact same line and has the success that he does 73 percent is obviously a a real high number but um I mean just good on guys just taking whatever role that they need to and that includes Blake Wheeler going to center as well I know you, t- you know it's, it's so cliche but we talk about the next man up mentality this is it on perfect display and kudos to management right now and the, and the pro scouting staff especially. You know, we talk about being active on the waiver wire. You know, you got guys like Spiza coming in, Nick Shore playing his first action. Uh, you know, Carl Dahlstrom getting the, the player of the game helmet a couple of games ago here in Winnipeg. You know, everybody, like Mitch has said, has just done a, a really good job of stepping into the role that they've been asked to play. And I just, you really like to see this. I think from the last few seasons, you know, it was expected that the Winnipeg Jets were going to win hockey games and, you know, it showed at the beginning of the year that things just were not going to come easy. But it's really nice to see a team win, team oriented, like things are happening because they're together. And, you know, not that they weren't before, but, you know, just nothing was going to come easy. It That became evident. And so they had to figure this out and they've clearly got it figured out in some aspects. You touched on the fact two years ago, if the Jets were trailing, which didn't happen very often, you kind of had that feeling they're coming back. Mm -hmm. This is a completely different team. They're down 2 nothing in Dallas, going into the third period, and you still have that feeling that you had two years ago, but it's a different type of feeling. If there's a way to explain it, they come back and tie the game, of course, losing overtime. Mm -hmm. But there's still that confidence that you touched on earlier. It's just interesting how it's changed from two, two seasons ago to now there's that same confidence, but there's less firepower, I guess. In some yeah, ways. maybe maybe it's just it. It might look a different way. It yeah. may not be the the tic tac toe passing plays that you know generate the goal. You look at Dallas. I mean, it's Blake Wheeler getting a shot off and just getting pucks to the net, like they always talk about. And then you know that one, sure, it goes off the goes off of Ben Bishop, pops up, goes off his skate and rolls in. So I mean, you'll you'll take the goals as they come, and then. Shifley's equalizer is a ton of skill involved. I mean, after that game, I do remember asking Blake about it. Like, you don't get to practice a whole lot of six on five. So what, you know, what goes into it? And he said, you know, you take your shots when you want, but the big thing, and this is kind of would describe him as a leader, I would say, you know, he's like, we got guys like Casey and and Nikolai Ehlers that are down there hounding pucks if that puck doesn't go in the net and that was one of the big reasons that the puck was able to come back toward Patrick Laine along the wall and then he was able to get that send that crazy pass to Shifley that had him so wide open and then Shifley as we talked about earlier buried it so they're they're finding ways whether it was in New Jersey where they score one at the end of the second period to get some momentum and then tie the game later in the third scoring three or if it's a game like in Dallas where it's just two they got a lot of confidence they've come back five times trailing through uh two periods to win hockey games so it's not like it's been one or, or a one-off it's something they've done a few times well and you look at the the tying goal against dallas what two games before that in los angeles the yeah. Ex- yeah literally the exact same play just slightly higher up in the zone happened and yeah. you know mark shifley doesn't bury well he buries on the second opportunity so yeah. clearly what blake wheeler is saying about kc and ehlers hounding pucks it's working yeah Nick Shore is uh, the newest member of the Winnipeg Jets, and as we tend to do here at Jets TV, we bring people in to get to people to know yeah. these new players better. And you two spoke with Nick Shore earlier this weekend. Here's that conversation. Shop where the players shop. Jets Gear and TrueNorthShop.com are your authentic team stores. Make sure to stock up on all your favorite Winnipeg Jets and Manitoba Moose merchandise today. Visit one of the five Jets Gear locations or shop online at TrueNorthShop.com. Hi, this is Mark Shifley, and you're listening to Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. Please be joined by the newest Winnipeg Jet, Nick Shore. Nick, number one, obviously the last few days have been a bit of a scramble, so appreciate you taking the time out. But uh, what if, if you could characterize kind of what the first few days have been like? You joined the team in Dallas. Now we're sitting here in Winnipeg the day before uh, 
taking on the Anaheim Ducks. Kind of what what have kind of the first few days been like? A bit hectic, but I think at the same time, uh, you know, leading into tomorrow and being able to watch a game, once you start playing, it gets a little easier. Um, you sort of fall into the routine that you're used to. So, you know, having said that, I think just really looking forward to tomorrow and getting going. You mentioned um, the the first game that you would have been with the team was in Dallas. You're up, you're upstairs, you're watching it. Just from a guy that's played a lot of forward, but you also played wing a little bit uh, this season. What are you what are you watching for? I mean, obviously there's subtle systems differences, but do you kind of like almost picture your game in your head and kind of see how that would fit in to the systems that you're watching on the ice? Yeah, I think so. Uh, like watching up top always helps a lot just from the standpoint of coming to a new team. And like you said, there's different tweaks and stuff systematically that you just have to be aware of. Um, so just picking up on that sort of things, so obviously watching different positions, you're able to learn a lot and, you know, hopefully just, you know, implement some of that tomorrow. I guess, uh, you know, when you, when you came to the team, they said, Paul said you were going to watch with one of the coaches. How beneficial was that to be able to watch with one of the coaches? It's good. So I watched the game with Woody up top. And yeah. like I said, I think one of the big things is when, you know, when you come to a new team, it's, you know, learning certain guys' tendencies and stuff like that. And having played against some of them, I think that definitely helps. Um, but at the same time, I think it's just sort of picking up on the, on the little tweaks and stuff that uh, they do differently than where, than where I was. So Cool. Um, you know, you come to a new team like this, the NHL and the hockey world's small one. Uh, any names that are familiar and faces? To be honest, I didn't really know uh, know anyone like sort of firsthand when I was coming here, which is sort of rare because you normally you know have played or with someone uh, on pretty much most of the teams. Right. But I had a couple of guys that played here that reached out and they just had good things to say about it. Like great guys in the room, all the way through the staff and everything. So I was just looking forward to kind of getting going. I'm sure they said specifically those Jets TV guys. They're great. <laughs> yeah, that was at the top of the list. <laughs> uh, just kind of looking back uh, over your career, before we even get to the National Hockey League, I'm looking at yourself and then three other brothers. What was that kind of like in the minor hockey world, especially for, I yeah. would say, your parents? Oh, they probably are so sick of hockey. <laughs> I feel bad for them. It, it's not easy uh, growing up. We had four boys that all played hockey. So, yeah, <laughs> poor parents had to be in way too many hockey rinks, I think, growing up. But... At the same time, they, they liked it, and mm-hmm. they were able to, you know, give us a lot of opportunity to do what we wanted to do. So, And then being from uh, Denver, I imagine you were a Colorado Avalanche fan growing up, but what did it mean to you to kind of, you played, because you played your NCAA hockey also at the University of Denver. What was mm-hmm. that kind of experience like for you? It was great. Um, growing up, I was an Avs fan, and I think that was one of the best times to be an Avs fan. No kidding. Was, yeah. they were, you know, they were awesome to watch back there. I had so many guys. I think Forsberg was maybe my favorite player growing up. Um, and then having the opportunity to sort of go back home to DU and play college hockey was, you know, another one of those things that I grew up, you know, went to a couple games. They'd won a couple national championships when I was younger. So uh, it was really, you know, I spent three years there, and it was one of the best three years mm-hmm. of my life. Is there – uh, brotherhood might be the too strong a word, but is there a little bit of like a, a college uh, college hockey kind of brotherhood in the National Hockey League? Because I look at uh, the Winnipeg Jets dressing room, you got Andrew Kopp and Kyle Connor, our big Michigan guys. You got mm-hmm. Blake Wheeler, obviously from Minnesota. But um, one of the things that Andrew Kopp, he said he played uh, USA National Team Development Program with one of your brothers. He was like, I, so I don't know Nick, but he yeah. said college guy. Obviously, he's a good guy. <laughs> No, I think there's always a bit of that going around the room, like college versus junior guys. But mm-hmm. um, I think hockey in general, you don't run into too many bad people. Yeah, <laughs> so that's a good that's, way to put it. That's nice, yeah. Uh, you know, obviously after your, your college career, you kind of were with the Los Angeles Kings. And in 2015, you won a Calder Cup with their AHL club, the Manchester yeah. Monarchs. Just tell us about that experience. Uh, just looking at your stats, you had 18 points in 19 games on the on the way to the championship. What was that whole experience like? It was awesome. Uh, we had a really good group that year, and I think any time you have a chance to win a championship, like no matter where it's at, you know, it's a great experience. Um, you know, still keep in touch with a lot of those guys. Just, you know, based off of that, you, you were able to grow with a lot of guys. And I think most of that team is, is playing still, so I think that's cool to see. Now, episode one of Ground Control Podcast, we had Paul Bissonette, who was on that team. Yeah, Biss was on the team, yeah. Uh, what is it like to have a, a guy with a personality like that that obviously is, you know, a contributor on the ice, but, you know, has more than just that factor to his game? Well, he's just a great locker room guy. Um, unfortunately for me, I, was, I wasn't there the whole time, which was nice, but he actually rented my room when I was gone, so I played half the year. And then I went back for playoffs and business there and everything. And I don't know how much contributing he did, like, on the ice. But like <laughs> you said, he was, just, like, 
he was a great guy to have in the room. Everyone liked him, kept things light. Um, and around that time of year, it's, it's good to have that. That's actually picking up on that. Um, one of the things that Paul Maurice talks a lot about is is guys that you know are really good in, in the room and, and just the value that they bring. One of, one of the names that was really brought up, especially the last couple seasons, was, was Matt Hendricks. It really seems like Anthony Botetto is one of those guys here. I think everybody in the in the dressing room really gets along, but just kind of from a guy that's been in you know a number of National Hockey League dressing rooms, American Hockey League dressing dressing rooms, how important are guys with, with personalities like that in terms of bringing everybody together? I think it's good. Um, you know, anytime you have you have guys that are able to sort of keep it light, but at the same time, you know, they, they have a voice that carries, and you know, around the room, it's respected. Um, that's a big big advantage, I think, to have, especially when you know it's over the course of eighty two games, not everything's going to be going smooth. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, during those times, it's it's nice to have those guys speak up. Played in. Ottawa, you've played in Calgary, you played in Toronto, a long list, now yeah. Winnipeg. Yeah, I'm just saying, in terms of the uh, Canadian markets, uh, how much value is it to you to have kind of the experience? Especially, I mean, Toronto is almost a whole other level, but just to have the experience of being in a Canadian market, what's that kind of like where it's cameras in the room absolutely every single day and it's seemingly, you know, Outside the room, sometimes it's a roller coaster of emotion, but in the room, it's always, you know, can't get too high, can't get too low. Just yeah. kind of what's it like being a player in a Canadian market? It's different. Um, you know, I spent my first couple years in LA, and that's sort of polar opposite. Mm-hmm. Uh, even having coming from Toronto this year, there's just a ton of noise. And yeah. most of it, like you said, is not from in the room. It's sort of outside, you know, whether you're watching TV or mm-hmm. what, on social media and stuff like that. So I think guys just do a good job of blocking it out, not worrying about it. Mm-hmm. You talk about the difference between LA and Toronto. How about uh, Magnitogorsk and Toronto? <laughs> I mean, I think I think we would be doing our listeners a disservice yeah. if we didn't ask you about Russia. Tell us about you know why you chose to go over there and just what the experience. Well, there's like. a lot of media there because I couldn't speak to anyone so. <laughs> <laughs> by design, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, um, but that w- it was a good experience for me. I think at the end of the day, a lot of people go over there with sort of the goal of coming back, and it doesn't always happen. So from that standpoint. I think I'm fortunate to be where I'm at, and I don't take that for granted. But it was a bit of culture change, you know. There's a, there's a lot of good stories that go along with it that I don't really want to dive into. <laughs> yeah, but, it's all good. Uh, I don't have any like bad things to say about it. They treated me really well when I was over there. I know Andre Chibishov is in in our organization here. Uh, just you, did you play at all? With I played him? a little bit with Chibi, yeah. Yeah, uh, quite the power forward. I mean, does he? We saw him in preseason, yeah. that sort of game. Paul seemed to really like his style and transfers to the North American game. Did you see some of those tendencies when you were over there? Yeah, like he's gifted. You know, he's a big, strong guy. He's got a lot of skill. Um, and I know over there, you know, he was able to use that to his advantage a lot. So I haven't seen him play since since he's come over, but, you know, I'm looking forward to that. One of the things that I think gets talked about when players come from, from overseas to, to North America is adjusting to the, to the size of the ice. And I remember being in... Helsinki uh they had it set up uh obviously for the global series to NHL dimensions but you could still see on the ground where the boards would be how different is that it looks like there's like three-ish feet Mm. and it just seems like not much but you always talk about people coming over and how much of an adjustment it it actually is so what's it like kind of going the other way I think going from an NHL size rink to like an Olympic sheet or some of them are like hybrid over there I think that's way easier because you know, the more time and space at the same time, you're not used to it, but it's, it's easier to get used to than going the other way. Yeah. You know, those, like even in warmups, those guys are skating around. They're used to, like you said, I don't know how many feet it is, but you know, the corners being deeper and everything, having a couple extra seconds with the puck. So, um, the transition for me going over there, I don't think is as hard as, you know, guys coming this way. Uh, I guess, uh, just to kind of wrap it up, Nick Shore away from the hockey arena. What, uh, what do you like to do in your spare time? What sorts of things keep you busy? Well, I think I'm going to have to find some new hobbies here, which I'm looking forward to. Um, you know, right now I'm at the Fairmont, but, you know, find a place and then, and then we'll go from there. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, Nick, like I said, it's a, it's a busy time for you, obviously, uh, preparing for not only games, but adjusting to a, to a new city. So we definitely appreciate you taking the time. Awesome. Thanks for having me. There has been. We're starting to see some good things, but we are looking to augment that. We're, we need more. Um, they're not going to 12 minutes. I, I like the way the top nine minutes spread out. So the, that group has to be effective in a low-minute situation. Those guys are getting better. Um, I just want to see the puck moved maybe a little differently, and we do have players coming back, so we'll, we'll again, competition's on. There's Paul Maurice, 
discussing the competition that is now in place with Nick Shore joining the hockey club. And now there are some bodies coming back, which is great to hear after 30 games. And it feels like yesterday that this happened, but in comes Mason Appleton after that freak injury in Regina. Yeah, and it, he's he's real close. I mean, I would anticipate he, like he's he's basically cleared to play. Mm. Um, Paul Maurice just wanted to get some more practices under his belt. I mean, he's been out for six weeks, so I mean, it's not just you're you're not just stepping back out there and being at full speed. So they want to get him uh, get him as confident as he can possibly be before getting into game action. But even still, and I thought that's like the clip we just ran. I thought that was an interesting comment from Paul Maurice, and it's a good one because you don't want to just you know, have people thinking that these spots are just there. I mean, because mm-hmm. for guys like uh, Logan Shaw and Yona Luoto who have played on the wings have, and have played real hard, and like even for David Gustafson who came out against the Ducks for Nick Shore to go in, Paul Maurice was very complimentary of Gustafson's game. He's, I mean, for a 19-year-old, he said his, his defensive reads and a lot of the things that he does on the ice are far ahead what it, what he expects out of a 19-year-old. So Gustafson's done a lot of a lot of real good things. Maurice just wanted to see the puck moved a little bit differently. And that's something that falls into uh, Nick Shore's uh, assets that he brings to the table. But so for Mason Appleton, of course, and I think he would anticipate this as well, that, you know, he's going to have to put in some some solid work and uh, earn that spot. Uh, And then Gabriel Bork as well. I mean, he's a little bit behind Appleton, but he was still full contact, full go uh, at practice on Saturday. So Gabriel Bork is probably not far behind. Both of those guys, Appleton and Bork, were uh, penalty killers uh, during their time uh, prior to their injury. So that's another uh, consideration for Paul Maurice. And then, unfortunately, no real update to pass along in terms of uh, Brian Little at this point. But uh, Dmitry Kulikov is probably in the same boat in that uh, he's not expected back until uh, the All-Star break. And that was the last update we got for him. Competition is a big part of success for your hockey club. And if you have guys fighting for minutes, that's that's a great thing. With Appleton coming back and Bork coming back, and David, you know, we should give some credit, which Mitch just did. It is a tough position for anyone that plays on that fourth line because the top nine forwards get so much ice time. And there's, of course, special teams plays a part in this. You're playing at most eight to ten minutes. Right. On a good night. Most times it's between five and eight, I guess, would be the best way to put it. Nick Shore played five, just over five in his first game with the Jets. I think we got to give a little bit more credit. You know, with the limited ice time that they have, the effectiveness of this, these fourth, the fourth line for, lately for the Jets. For sure. I mean, that Gustafson, Luoto, and Shaw trio, mm-hmm. when they first were put out there and rolled out there as, as a line, and they've been a line for quite a chunk of games, you know, it took some time. You know, they were hemmed down in their own end. Fair, sure. But over the last bit, as we've said here on the podcast before, they started to figure it out, spending some time in the ozone. And I think I think the first thing when it, when it comes to playing roles such as the fourth line, where you're not, it's not getting a whole chunk of minutes, all these guys before they showed up on the Winnipeg Jets roster were probably logging big minutes wherever they were before. Mm-hmm. Luodo was a driver, and so was Shaw for the Manitoba Moose. You have Gustafson, who's you know very likely a, a pretty strong uh, Swedish Hockey League player. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we've talked about that before. So to accept the role that you're given, and I, I think, you know, there's some realities to the situation. He's a smart guy. He understands why, why he's here and what he's brought here to do and what he's going to be as a future Winnipeg Jet. But I think just you have to give those guys a lot of credit for what they've been able to do here. Um, and it, it's no knock on them coming out of the lineup, but, you know, you're at a little bit more experience perhaps with uh, – Mason Appleton and, and Gabriel Bork coming back into the lineup. Obviously, competition's good. They got to earn their right, and I think I think that's good. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how that fourth line shakes down and and how they're able to change things. Mitch, the timing almost kind of seems perfect. And when we talk about David Gustafson, there's a strong chance, should he not stay with the hockey club, he's probably likely going to play for Sweden at the World Juniors again, which only helps in his development. We've heard that many times. And there's a, there's still a bitter taste in David's mouth from the World Juniors last year where they lost to Switzerland in the quarterfinals. And he had mentioned that last year when we talked to them at training camp, or sorry, at um, prospect, prospect development camp. Um, and we sat down with David Gustafson. He still uh, said his bother with that. So that would be great if that opportunity does arise for him, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, and I mean, it's not necessarily uh, – I think Paul Marie spoke about that uh, a couple of days ago where he just basically said, like, the World Juniors, they're, they're not in the forefront of Paul Maurice's mind. He said number one is always going to be – uh, the Winnipeg Jets, and then 
number two uh, will be the the best for the development of David Gustafson. Mm-hmm. I mean, earlier uh, earlier in the month, I think it was less than a week ago, Vili Hainalo was was named to the to finish uh, Team Finland's World Junior Camp roster. That was expected, uh, as was Nikonen, uh, another one of the Jets draft picks uh, from the most recent draft. So, if that ends up happening for David Gustafson, cool. I mean, he'll be a, he'll play a big a big role there. But Paul Murray said, listen, like. There's a whole lot of value in in NHL minutes or AHL minutes as well. So, yeah. whatever happens with Gustafson, I think right now he's as we speak and record this podcast, he's with the Winnipeg Jets. And you know, when he gets in the lineup, those minutes and the experience that he gets out of it is massive. So, is that the best for his development or what is? That'll be a conversation between uh, Paul Maurice, Kevin Shovelayoff. They'll determine what's best for him. Kudos to him for just even being in this situation. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's quite remarkable. Uh, Jets rewards time. Uh, 50 Jets reward points on the line. The word today is, if you're thinking about Nikolai Ehlers, he is strong. <laughs> Nikolai Ehlers strong uh, is the word we're going to go with. Strong is actually the code word for you, so put that in at jetsrewards.ca, and 50 Jets rewards are yours. Uh, Paul Maurice pointing out that Nikolai Ehlers a lot stronger than people think, or a lot tougher, I guess, is the term he would go with. And by the way, in case you're keeping track of these things, Jets are now 2-1. and one. Whenever Nikolai Ehlers decides to scrap That's in the national hockey, somewhere in the game notes. That's <laughs> Scott Unger. It's on you now, my friend. Uh, once again, thanks for tuning in to uh, Ground Control Official Podcast, the Winnipeg Jets. We will talk to you again next week. This is Big Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets, hosted by Jets TV. For Jets news, videos, and more, head to WinnipegJets.com. 